So now uh, we go to up to the next uh, topic, uh, introduction to OSHA. Uh, they have this uh, pamphlet, which is uh, mandatory to be posted on site, where they, they explain the employer's responsibility and the employee's uh, rights uh, under OSHA. We're going to discuss that uh, today. So it's uh, the, the objective is to provide information about OSHA, why is that important, you know, what rights do you have under OSHA, what responsibilities the employer has, uh, you know, where are the standards, how to look for them, uh, where to go for help if you need any. Okay, why uh, is OSHA important? Uh, OSHA began uh, because until 1970 there was no laws that will, you know, that will, that will prevent accidents in the workplace. On average, 15 workers die every day from job injuries. Um, 5,600 Americans die from workplace injuries annually. Over 4 million non-fatal, uh, non-fatal uh, workplace injuries and illnesses are reported. There are a lot of uh, uh, statistics in the OSHA website, and of course they change uh, year by year. Um, here is a, a short video of uh, how the workers work before uh, OSHA. This is the construction of the Empire State Building. You can see there is no, you know, all the rest systems, the safety here. It's kind of. Um, that was back in the day. Really? Uh, yeah. Uh, Can you imagine being working at that height without any like kind of uh, support if you fell? Yeah. Then uh, that's, that's, where that, that's where that famous frame came from. That you see four or five guys, yeah, guys sitting on sitting an island. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what you don't see is that there's like 35 mile an hour winds while they're sitting yeah, up there doing there that. There you go. Exactly right. It's a, it's a pretty high uh, building. So it's uh, look yeah. at the guys in the corner. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, very good. So that, that gives you, you know, a, a view of the past, you know, how things were done before. Uh, I'm sure you have many stories about the ocean, so let, let's hear some of them, you know. When, when did you first hear about the ocean, your work? Oh, oh good. <laughs> Actually, I haven't had any, any experience with that. So maybe at the airport, and they couldn't do anything because when they went in, they said that the uh, the trench and what happened, there was nobody in the trench. So so they have a trench that was not properly protected. Right, and and, uh, and since there was nobody there, that's what they said at the time. And of course, a contractor came and started shoring it later on. It was all sand. Okay. When I first started in construction, um, I would frame houses in the north out of wood, and my foreman, it was, you don't need to clip on. If you're a real man, you can walk across the joists. You can't walk across the joists, you can't be a framer, <laughs> you know? That was the kind of mentality that, you know, back in the 90s still, you know? Now, it's just, when they come to our job site, it's like, you know, the cops are coming. Yeah, everybody's just like, everybody, hides and make sure they have their hard hat and vest on and you know don't come talk to me kind of an attitude yeah, yeah. all right interesting uh so what do you think about the uh, osha uh, at that time uh, i don't like to see him <laughs> <laughs> but with the, i'm because i'm i'm in the uh, inspection side of things uh -huh. uh I came on as a, in the company first before I started running it, uh, just as an assistant to the engineers. And uh, one of the first tasks I got to kind of do on my own was we got a call for a, a slip test, slip resistance test mm -hmm. for some of the condos going up along in Miami Beach. So for those uh, for those tests, the engineer said, "Okay, you know, uh, just find out about it. You know, get some research done, see what exactly is required for us to be able. The client wants us to do this thing." Uh, see what we need to do because we're not builders we don't interact with OSHA we don't have to deal with that it was just kind of you know in the background just wear your steel toe boots and wear a hard hat you know when you go on a site 
right. uh, as an assistant when I first came on. But when I was researching that is when I kind of saw a little bit more like a different side to the ocean because uh, there really was no strict standard on what is slippery and what is not slippery. Mm -hmm. So you have maybe a couple of different bodies who kind of determine what is slippery, what isn't slippery. And OSHA is one of those that determine, okay, hey, this is, uh, for something to be slippery, it has to be more than this friction. Okay. Uh, coefficient of friction. So if you're underneath that, we don't think it's slippery. All right. Uh, as far as OSHA is concerned. So if a client, if some city inspector read that guide, uh, the city inspector doesn't want any slippery buildings in, in his district. Mm -hmm. So they start putting the pressure on the builder, and the builder has no idea, what, what do I need to do? There's no, it's not in the building code. Yeah. The building code just refers to acceptable slippery standards or something like that. Right, so, so you have to look into why Yeah, I kind of find out that, that OSHA, so my, my first uh, uh, understanding of OSHA was more along the lines of, wow, this is really interesting. They're actually creating some of these standards. There's a lot of bodies creating standards for which I end up getting work mm -hmm. uh, because I have to end up either inspecting based upon those or, or do something that the client needs. So it ends up being one of those bodies that's creating certain standards that others aren't necessarily thinking about. So it was it was interesting. So now, like whenever I write my report, I have to make reference on it that I'm right. this is the standard I'm following. Yeah, exactly. So I'm following OSHA's standard of this. It's met as well as uh, you know any building code is referring to the OSHA standards often. Good. Any comments? Anything else on that? All right. So, what do you think? It's uh, OSHA's job. Preservation of life. Yeah. That's why they didn't do anything with his excavation. They can care less about the dirt, equipment. If there's not somebody in there, they can care less. Yeah. yeah. All right. Very good. Uh, all right. This is a, a, a catastrophe report. Uh, basically, they. On their website, if you go to to the OSHA website, which is uh, OSHA.gov. Uh, oh, no, wait a minute. Actually, you think about that it was just live, but what failed in that excavation was one of the uh, the post stands on the jet fuel lines at Miami International Airport. So if that would have broken, the contamination would have been. Horrendous. Yeah, and then they would have just deferred to EPA, yeah. so EPA and, and or somebody else. So, and they got so over nobody. the owner was the one that called Unless somebody was exposed to chemicals. Then and that was the best story. Now we want to test him. Right. Yeah. So the, the, it actually was the owner who called OSHA at the time. It was not the contractor or anybody. It was the owner. Yeah. Yeah. CYA. Yep. <laughs> Fire department. <laughs> All right, uh, what I was saying before, if you go to the OSHA website, that's uh, OSHA.gov, uh, they have a ton of information on this website. Some of those have to do with the data and the statistics, you know. The, um, go down right here to establishment search. That's one that a lot of people use. See here, inspection details and definitions. Okay. Right there, establishment search. So if you hire somebody to do work for you, you can go in there and put their name in there, and now you can tell whether they've been visited by OSHA, if they've been cited, if they haven't been cited, Ooh. if they still have an open mm -hmm. claim. See, I got a lot of people that come and say, hey, look at my portfolio of work. I'm a great contractor, but you don't know how they actually perform and yeah. if they're going to be a liability. So you can go in there and look them up. A lot of times you interview a company, they're like, yeah, no, we have a great safety record. We're like, really, you got cited twice in 2006 for the same thing. You guys don't learn or you guys... On my job site, you're going to do it like this, or you're not going to do it. So it's a good it's intro good into pre construction meetings to pull somebody's company right there. Wow. I didn't know that. That's a great tool. Huh? Jeez. That is a great tool. Excellent. Thank you. I didn't know about that one either. And of course, now if OSHA catches you doing something that used to be on your record for three years, now it's on there for five. For five, right? Five. So. Okay. So the one that I wanted to look at is uh, catastrophes. It's traffic. Uh, they have a uh, fatality and catastrophe investigations here, where uh, you know shows uh, the. Um, it's not the one I'm looking for. Uh, reports. There you go. The weekly reports. 
So these weekly reports, you know, it shows uh, some incidents that had happened uh, before. So I took this uh, 2013. This is as March 2nd, 2013. And uh, what I would like to do is, you know, go over the room. Uh, you guys read the the case, and then we we'll talk a little bit about, you know, how could that have been prevented? If so, you want to start with the number one? Uh, date of incident: February 18th. Uh, Cat Spec Limited, Ardmore, Oklahoma. And the uh, description of the incident was: employee died while working in a confined space at a crude re oil refinery. First thing you have to do when you look at these tables is know that they have multiple industries in there. So it could be general industry, like warehouses, factories, could be construction, could be agriculture. So when I read that and I say in a confined space in a crude oil refinery, I consider that general industry, not construction. So mm -hmm. a lot of times if OSHA brings these numbers to an association meeting, we say, hey, this is room is full of construction people. So tell us what we're doing wrong. Don't tell us what the oil refineries are doing wrong, okay? So that's first of all, um, but... I guess you don't make too many friends in OSHA. <laughs> <laughs> We're colleagues. Okay. Okay. Um, Sounds like your enemies. Yeah, well, employee died while working in a confined space at a crude oil refinery. So, I don't know, what do you want us to talk about? What, what, what do you think? Went wrong? I mean, uh, it could have been prevented. Uh, oh, okay, definitely. I mean, in oil refineries, you know you have a lot of silos, you have a lot of tankers, so you know you're going to be working in confined spaces. Um, and we don't know why he died. Did right. he go inside? Could Was it not cleaned out? They, usually they go into uh, a lot of the deaths are because they go in there to do um, welding repairs. Right. And there's still some gases in there. When they turn on their welder, boom, it's And that's yeah. what happens. Exactly. So, or it could be, you know, gases, toxic gases toxic. That, that can. Right. Uh, you and know, they didn't clear out the, the air, box. they didn't monitor them. You yeah. know, if you're going to enter a confined space, you have to drop an air monitor in there, get a right. reading, make sure it's good before you put them down. You have to have a rescue winch, so if he does pass out, you can winch him out of there, as opposed to sending somebody else in, so right. a lot of things come up when you see that. But the first thing you look at when you see this is you know they're going to get sued because oil refinery, you know they know. You know they do it a lot, and yet it still happens. So okay. you're going to have a, a big negligence case there. And they have deep pockets. And they got deep pockets, of course. There you go. The yeah. number one requirement, requirement for Requirement to, to get sued. Okay. Can you read uh, number two, please? The date of incident is February 19, 2013. JJ's restaurant in Kansas City. The employee killed in a natural gas explosion. Okay. We don't Doesn't give it. much explanation, yeah. but I don't know. Maybe proper equipment will help protect it. Being a, a restaurant, probably, you know, gas in, a, in an oven, somebody turned on that switch. Probably and lack of maintenance is probably what happened. Probably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. Number three. Uh, day of incident, February 21st. Donald L. Shirley Lumber Company. Worker struck and killed by a fallen tree. Um, uh, they probably had a, an area where you shouldn't stand because they were cutting down the trees. And maybe he walked into it when they were working. Right. Something on the Or maybe the tree fell the, wrong, fell the wrong way. The, uh, the lady from OSHA was telling us that uh, one of the biggest issues they're having right now it's in, in uh, people working on on um, garden and uh, landscaping uh, because they, they go <coughs> and and, and uh, cut the, the trees and they don't realize there is a high voltage line going across so they touch it and bang somebody gets electrocuted so that, that's a big issue they're, they're having now uh, number four Date of incident, uh, February 22nd, 2013. Hagel Metal Fabrication Incorporated, East Peoria, Illinois. A worker operating a laser machine was struck and killed by metal debris. Oh. Somewhat similar to the falling tree, maybe the metal debris fell <clears throat> where they weren't expecting it to fall. Mm -hmm. Or someone was standing where they shouldn't have been standing. Right. Okay, uh, number five. Uh, February 23rd, 2013, RSI Home Product Manufacturing, Inc., Lincolnton, North Carolina. Worker killed after being caught in a saw machine at cabinetry facility. This probably goes back a couple of uh, last module where we went over, uh, you know, potential issues of 
having a worker in a situation where he's either overworked, not right. paying attention, you know, endless Safety guards sticking off, yeah. or something like that, yeah, very good. Number six? Mm, well, February 24th, 2013, Turner Specialty Service at LLC there, Louisiana. Uh, employee crushed and killed by conveyor belt rollers uh, undergoing maintenance. Probably didn't made a proper disconnection or tag and the somebody tag didn't out, say it and they just something yeah, somebody they, turned on the, yeah, the, the switch tag and they probably tag or something yeah. or maybe whoever it was tag and somebody took the tag off. Yeah. Exactly. We will look at the, some of the ways to prevent that kind of an accident. Very good. Uh, seven, back there. Seven. Um, date of incident, 2-25-2013, uh, CSC Sugar LLC, Fairless Hills, Pennsylvania. Um, employee killed after falling into a sugar hopper. Hopper, yeah. Well, we don't know exactly how is that uh, equipment hit kill, but the sugar is one of those uh, materials that you can get swallowed in and mm -hmm. asphyxiated uh, if you're in. Now, we, we don't know, the hopper may have something that, that killed him. Uh, anyway, number eight. February 25th, 2013, J.G. Boswell Company, Bakersfield. Worker John after accident caused, caused the vehicle to land in the canal. Okay, that's another issue that, that this lady uh, talked about is that uh, they, they're having another great number of uh, uh, employees killed. They, they're running a, a lawnmower uh, and then they get close to, to a canal and the surface is very slippery. So the machine turns over, gets into the water and the employee uh, drowns. So. That, that's another a big issue that they're having. What do you think uh, can be, how can that be prevented? Well, usually the manufacturers of those lawnmowers will tell you you can't operate at a certain pitch. Right. Or within a certain amount of degrees. Obviously, they always override that. But there's there's equipment that they can put off. It's almost Same like outrigger arms where you can have it out so that you don't tip in. Right. Or, you can have rollover protection, but typically what happens, they don't have their seatbelt on, they roll over, they get thrown out, and then the machine lands on them. Yeah. And then they may still be up, but they're underwater, so they end up drowning. Right. Yeah. Pretty sad. Number nine. February 25th, 2013. Any Galvin Sons, West Virginia. Boys struck by and killed by a falling tree. Yeah. Same as the, the one before. Number 10. February 25th, 2013, Sidewinder Drilling Company, company uh, Carrollton, Ohio, worker killed when struck by drilling equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, number 11, 226, 2013, Gilles Aurelian Flory Trust, Anaheim, California, worker died after falling 14 feet to concrete on construction site. Okay, so for the rest, this is probably. I'm already working on the falling off a ladder. Yeah, only 14 feet from the ladder. It's yeah. not. Depends on if you land on your head or land on your feet. Yeah, it's, it's not too much, but it's said it could uh, fall from your head, you know. And, uh, there's, there's been fatalities where people fall off the second rung of a ladder. Yeah. So it doesn't, the height doesn't, they really, hide that, it doesn't yeah. determine anything. It's how you fall. Yeah. That's how you fall. And uh, I was talking to, to a specialist the other day about the fall resistance, and he said there are some people who will faint when when they feel the the you know that they're falling. So they, there is no chance that you will grab something or or try to to maneuver yourself while you're falling to to prevent uh, a bigger injury. So you know you faint, boom, you hit your head, you come. Next one. The number twelve. Ass plug tree expert company uh, worker struck and killed by falling tree. Same as uh, some of the before. Thirteen. Uh, March first, uh, two thousand thirteen. Uh, CRVR Inc. California. Work 
worker struck and killed by projectile while welding. Okay. <clears throat> 14. Uh, Fourteen. 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 Fourteen.
OSHA approved programs and, and they do not uh, fall under the federal uh, guidelines. So what they do is they, they have uh, partnerships with companies in different states that do uh, inspections and so on. In Florida, that's not the case. They do have their own office and their employees do the um, inspections and, and so on. Um, let's see. Uh, they they deal with uh, a, a lot of um, uh, issues, including you know uh, violence in the workplace. Not only the you know safety from the OSHA Focus Four and other um, hazards, but also uh, attitudes like the uh, violence. Um, I want to look where uh, the where are there uh, there are some limitations where uh, people do not uh, fall under OSHA regulations. Some of those are if you are uh, you know um, sole employee if you're just by yourself if you're working. I don't remember where is that. I think it, it, it I was pretty sure it was here. I think it's here, yeah. Yeah, here we go. Who OSHA covers? Uh, private sector workers, uh, state and local governments that uh, do not have a, a um, that are not covered by other um, agencies. So the, there's some that are not covered under the OSHA. If you're self-employee, immediate family members of farm employers who do not uh, employ outside employees, basically the, the logic behind it is that they, they say, well, if you have your family members working for you, you want those people to be safe. So then, you know, they, they, they don't get much into that. And whenever the hazards are regulated by another federal agency like mine and safety the uh, health uh, mine and safety and health administration federal aviation the coast guard uh, the mine industry have their own um, uh, regulations also they, we we saw before briefly uh, that uh, the OSHA standards can be found here uh, under the regulations tab. So the, under the regulations tab, we have different standards. We have the general industry, what you were mentioning before. We have general industry, construction, maritime, agriculture, record keeping, and then uh, they have uh, additional information there. So if you go under uh, construction, they have uh, all their regulations over here. And I think I did show this uh, before, right? Uh, when we talked about the 1926 Code of Federal Regulations, that's uh, OSHA regulations uh, for construction. So you have uh, all the, the different um, regulations. The, the nice thing about this is that you can do, you know, right click, um, I mean, you, you can go here and do the search, for example, false. And then uh, it will bring uh, uh, issues related to uh, falls. So you can you can look uh, at a particular regulation. Uh, you can also do, you know, you, you can click in here uh, and, uh, and look at any one of the uh, particular regulations uh, from OSHA. So that, that that's very uh, convenient. All right. So Harry Adams, it's a minor worker uh, below ground Inc. Is he covered by OSHA? No, right? Because there is a, a uh, it's under the mining. It's under mining. Very good. I'm sure. Aaron Smith, uh, one of three employees of ABC Landscaping. Yes. 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 Taylor Dale, an accountant no. uh, in business. No. no. Well, that depends. Number two. Adrian Smith, one of 
three. Oh, one of three plays. I'm sorry. Yeah, one of three. Yeah. No, but he. But, but maybe he's under a cultural too. Well, um, but he's got less than three employees. That's no, the key ABC there. It's ABC. It it, that, well, that's what the question I was going to raise because if he's ABC landscaping, putting palms on on my job site, then he's considered construction. If he's doing maintenance down the turnpike because of a contract, it's they has, then he falls under agricultural. Mm -hmm. But the key there is that yes, it's a company with less than three employees. Yeah. Uh, Rob Jones with the Ten Computers and Wood Inc. Yes. Oh, yes. yes. Very good. Okay. The mission of OSHA is to save lives, uh, prevent injuries, and protect uh, American workers. Uh, so some things that the OSHA does to carry out their mission is to develop safety and health standards. We just saw the web page with the different regulations. Maintain and reporting uh, record keeping systems to keep track of the injuries. That's how they have this uh, huge database of uh, reports uh, from different um, inspections, provide training programs to increase knowledge about occupational safety and health. Now, uh, they do not do training themselves. They do grants and uh, then they give, you know, other organ uh, institutions uh, money to train people like uh, USF. It's a big one here in Florida where they do the OSHA 500 training, you know, for those of you, I also have it, uh, to teach the employers and give them the 10-hour card or the 30-hour cards. Uh, that's a, a big uh, training program. They also have uh, other certifications in safety. I don't know. Yeah, they have talked to you. They do it through um, Susan Hartwood grants, uh -huh. um, and they uh, channel money through them. <laughs> like, for instance, they had one where they granted money to uh, the train corporation. Um, I'm sorry, not train. Uh, they did one for, for Sherwin Williams, and Sherwin Williams hosted the trainings for lead abatement because since they're a paint manufacturer, you have these issues where a lot of people were doing remodels to old condos or old houses that have paint. I think it was before 1960 something, or 1950 something, um, where all the paints that were used on your house or anything had lead in it. So if you go in there, you do any type of sanding or peeling or stripping. You need to have a certified lead abatement person go through a training. And so through the Susan Hardwood grant, they gave them money, and Sherman, Sherwin Williams is the one that hosted all of those trainings oh. with that money. And Good. everybody went and got certified. Excellent. What, what he's uh, talking about, you can find on OSHA a training site, uh, the grants, the Susan Hardwood training grants. That's mm -hmm. uh, what you were mentioning. And then uh, there are some you know, directions on how to apply for a grant requirements and so on. They have worker trainings, OSHA training institutes. So here you can look into, you know, how to get uh, additional uh, training in safety. So uh, for, for us here in, 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 uh, in uh, Florida, uh, the biggest one is um, uh, USF. Yeah, USF, so, they just opened up a local office now have an office now on the East Coast because they used to just be out of Tampa, right? Out of Tampa. Yeah. Um, but they just opened up uh, an office over here. I believe it's in West Palm and they have another training center in Maryland. Oh, really? oh. In Maryland. Yeah. Okay. Good. So here's some of the uh, courses uh, that you can take, you know, descriptions and so on and uh, just look into uh, training uh, if, you, if you want uh, to learn more about it. Uh, they have a lot of information in this, uh, in this uh, website. I mean, it's incredible the amount of uh, stuff they put in. And they're always uh, improving it and adding more uh, information. Okay, so I think, uh, well, we learned that. Uh, oh. In 1968, at I'm the sorry that we don't have uh, sound here. This video is our. Kind of cool. So I'm gonna make sure that we have beat, uh, sound for the next that same year, another uh, session because uh, some of these are but those really cool. Lost right here in the uh, I would recommend that you because those go and look at them at home. Were killed at work uh, on the job.
Another two okay. and one half the rights uh, that you may have on the ocean, you have the right of a safe uh, and healthful workplace. This is the, the, the main goal that they have, to provide uh, employees with a safe and healthy uh, workplace. Know about hazardous chemicals, uh, information about injuries and illnesses in the workplace, complain or request hazard correction from the employer, Get in training, hazard exposure, and medical records. Right uh, you have the right to, to file a complaint with OSHA. Conditions. Participate in those inspections and be free from retaliation if you decide to, to work in the exercise the safety the employer. Right. So many hours for so much money. There is a, a poster no uh, that it's, uh, you know, it showed that somewhat before. Uh, it's a. Okay requirement to have this uh, on-site uh, okay. so this shows okay. the you know the the rights and obligations employees you have the right to notify your employer or OSHA about workplace hazards you may ask OSHA to keep your name confidential. We saw the, the form to uh, file a complaint. You have the right to request an OSHA inspection if you believe that there are unsafe and helpful conditions in your workplace, or your, uh, your, or your representative may participate in that inspection. You can file a complaint with OSHA within 30 days of retaliation or discrimination by your employer for making safety and health uh, complaints or exercising your rights under OSHA. So if you feel that you've been discriminated in any way uh, because you're um, exercising your rights, you have 30 days to tell OSHA. You have the right to see OSHA citations issued to your employer. Your employer must post the citations are, uh, at or near the place of the alleged uh, violation. Your employers must correct workplace hazards by the date indicated in the citation and must certify that these hazards have been reduced or eliminated. You have the right to copies of your medical records and records of your exposure to to toxic and harmful substances. Your employer must post this notice in your workplace. You must comply with all occupational safety and health standards issued under the OSHA Act they apply to your own actions and conduct on the job. Employers, you must furnish your employees a place of employment that is free from recognizing the hazard. You must comply with the Occupational Safety and Health Standards issued under the OSHA Act. You recognize these two paragraph? Yeah, right? They're called the General Duty Clause. It's, um, it's a, the, the catch-all that OSHA has. So if they do not have a regulation about the hazard that you have on your job site, they can claim the general duty clause. Because you have, uh, you, you're failing to provide your employees with a place of employment that is free from hazards. So they can find you because of that. So those two paragraphs are kind of uh, very important in this um, uh, brochure. But isn't that uh, you have a key word there that is recognizable? Yeah, but hindsight's twenty twenty. So when yeah. they show up that like an accident happened, you should have seen it. Here's your citation. That's that's why they rub contractors the wrong way with that catch-all phrase. Yeah. yeah, that's just the way to. And then, then here it is again. Uh, it, it calls to it, it's called Section Five A One of the OSHA Act. Each employer shall furnish to each of his employees employment and a place of employment which are free from recognized hazards that are causing or likely to cause death or serious physical harm to his employees. Right, so how do you recognize a hazard? Usually you see a hazard, right? And then you make corrections for it. So I always bring up the Walmart example, that guy that got stampeded and trampled over on Black Friday. Right, yeah. He opened the door. Yeah, they've seen it. They've seen it 20,000 million times over, over all their stores that people stampede. Nothing ever happened. Right. It happened, and OSHA shows up and says, well, you should have known that that was going to happen. Yeah. 
You didn't come here before it happened. You came here after it happened. Yeah. We're in the same boat you are. But yet they got fined one hundred seventy-eight thousand mm dollars -hmm. for that case. So. No, and, and, and it's tough. You know, you know yeah. what is recognized hazards by who, when, what is recognizable? It happening and not happening. You thinking about it? It's tough. Yeah, there's it's, a lot, there's a lot of gray area there, so it, it ends up in a long court battle. What it ends up in. Mm -hmm. right. And probably yeah, it's cheaper it to pay the hundred thousand. Well, you know what Walmart did, of course. Yeah, the guy who got trampled his family costs a lot more than yeah. I'll pay him another million. It's still cheaper than the attorneys. Unfortunately. Yeah, nothing against Walmart, but that, that's a, sometimes a dangerous place to be. You know, you go there at night, and you have all these people, you know, doing maintenance while the other ones are putting restock in the, the shelves, and you know, you see a guy with a a lift, uh, changing a light, and you're just walking by and. Right, but that's different. Let's say you have all that happening. Some guy drops half a pallet of some canned food, yeah. and it falls right next to a guy or hits a guy in the shoulder. Now you record that accident. You have documentation that that's occurred. Now that happens again, you kill somebody. I can understand why you're on the hook. It's happened before you should have seen it, and it's a potential of something might happen. The guy getting trampled, it's the first time yeah, anybody's even got enough paper cut by opening doors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They also make it more complicated by staying open. So you get customers in there. Right, while hours. workers are in there, yeah, so yeah, yeah. routinely it would be just employees, and you've maintained a safe, you know, area for the employee to do his work. But now, it's but the now you, the employer, have caused that place to become unsafe just by throwing in a bunch of you know uh, random customers who you can't control. Well, that's why Home Depot closes so, the well, lanes. I was going to say they close the lane in the front, they close the lane yeah, in the yeah, back. And you think true. that it just happened out of nowhere? That yeah. when that's I was probably. a kid, that didn't do that in Home Depot. You'd be like, "Pee pee, Dad would hold you." Be like, "Wait, let the forklift go by." Yeah. Obviously, somebody got hit. Yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah. And and, and you, you you say, well, how can you get a hit if you, that uh, forklift now say beep and the thing you know goes, "Hey, hey, hey, be careful." Still, you know, people get hit with that. And actually, while the forklift is running, you've got two people, one in front, you one in the back. Yeah, yeah. Right, to make sure you don't run over anybody's foot. Yeah, it's, it's, it has changed, and I'm sure. The same with OSHA, you know, those regulations are written in blood. Mm -hmm. Something has have to happen for those regulations to be there. Somebody must have to get hurt or, or, or die. Okay. Um, know about uh, hazardous chemicals. Uh, employers will have a written complete hazard communication program that includes information about labeling the, uh, the, the materials. They have what's called the material safety data sheets, MSDS, that have information about the uh, chemical, what to do in case of uh, if you can contact with it, you know, first aid uh, procedures and so on. Uh, I was told that they are going away from this now and, and there's going to be a uh, global system that has information for yeah, the hazards. Uh, I read on the book or saw it somewhere. That <laughs> yes, the GHS. So they're, gonna, they're not going to be called material safety data sheets anymore. They're going to be called SDSs, safety data sheets. Yeah. And the GHS is globally harmonized system. And what they're doing, what they found was that you have different countries manufacturing different chemicals and materials and there wasn't a consistency on these material safety data sheets. Right. Usually there's 16 sections in there talk about first aid, what it's called, who manufactures it, how to store it, if it's flammable, all that good stuff. Sure. So they weren't consistent and people were having trouble finding the information on there. So they really, and they had some issues with literacy. Okay. So now the GHS, what they're doing is that every, I'm not sure about when the, the compliance dates are, um, for all these manufacturers to convert over to this new SDS. Yeah, I think it's uh, 1014 that they're, they're moving into. I right, they're allowed to use whatever labels they've had printed up till now, but by mm -hmm. 2014 they have to have been 100% converted over. And right. they, uh, there's basically, they're going to use, I believe it's seven or nine pictograms. So it'll have pictures. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you don't know how to read, you turn over the bag of cement, and in the back it'll have a picture with a flammable or a picture with a guy with goggles and a picture of the guy with hands. So it says, hey, it's flammable, wear goggles, wear gloves. Okay. So they make it real standardized across the board. So that's what they're going with. Very good, excellent. Yeah, I just learned this uh, this week also. 
Here's an example of the uh, material safety data sheet. It's uh, posted on our uh, course uh, website under module three. So you can you can go ahead and uh, and, and look at it. Uh, I can save it in the right place, right? Yes. Yes. That, yes. I think that that global is easier because yeah, it's a good ninety percent of the people. Even when they, when and we we request thinking, them. Not, not only that, a lot of the companies that have been established forever, when they give them to you, they have form oil in there from 1972. They're like, well, I've been buying the same deal, but it's nobody really uses it. And it's, like I said, like for the people who have literacy issues, the, the pictogram is really going to help them out. Right. Yeah, very good. Uh, what did you learn from uh, learn that? About what, the GHS? Yeah. It's been, it's been, they've been talking about it for a while. Uh, it's actually been... A topic of conversation for about two years, but now it's actually coming to fruition. Coming where, into, into effect. Right, where they're telling the, the manufacturers that, hey, you have to start adhering to these labels by a certain period of time so that you can phase out all of your old stuff. You know, some people have reserves with labels already on them. Mm -hmm. So they're going to let them kind of um, phase those out and get into the new ones. But um, as far as training on SDSs, there's going to be a whole new requirement on new requirement. you have to train on hazard communication. Yeah. But well, this is the, the, the old uh, material safety data sheet, so it has information about the, uh, the company, uh, how uh, hazardous the material is in terms of health, flammability, reactivity, protection, the ingredients, you know, the uh, hazard identification, if you breathe, eat, you have eye contact, skin contact, you know, firefighting measurements, um, handling and storage, Exposure to the chemicals, you know, toxicological information, uh, how to do transportation, you know, and others. So it has a lot of uh, good info on on terms of the um, chemicals. Right. Then uh, they also pretty big in record keeping. Uh, they they ask you to keep records of all the uh, injuries and illnesses on the on the uh, work site. Uh, if you have more than uh, ten uh, workers, um, workers have the right to review current logs, uh, and then you have to be you keep you have to maintain your records for at least five years. Workers also have the right to view their annual posted summary of injuries, uh, which is uh, due actually now, right? It's from March, March to February. What are you talking about? Well, I'm sorry. The, sorry. the log of um, injuries. Oh, you have to have it posted on your site until April 1st. <coughs> okay. April 1st or April 30th? Yeah. Okay, so employees have the, the right to, to um, write a complaint, uh, right to have training. We talked a little bit about this before. Right to examine the uh, records, participate in OSHA inspections, be free from retaliation. Um, Uh, employers have uh, a responsibility under OSHA, uh, you know, again, provide a workplace free from recognizing hazards and comply with the standards. That's the general duty clause. We will, we will be seeing that over and over again until it's, uh, you know, to memorize that thing. Uh, keep records of injuries and illnesses, post the citations and abatement uh, verification process, notices, I'm sorry. Provide and pay for PPE which is uh, personal protective uh, equipment. So employers uh, are required to keep records of injuries and illnesses, um, report each worker death, report each incident that hospitalizes three or more workers, maintain uh, injury and illness records, inform workers of how to report uh, injury or illness to the employer, Make records available for workers, allow OSHA access to records, post the annual summary of injuries and illnesses. That's the OSHA 300 log, where you, you have the uh, records of uh, injuries posted on your, on your site. 
Oh, here's the, uh, the date. Right, okay. Uh, no, this is not the date. Uh, sorry, for some reason I don't have that uh, information here and it's, it's important. Uh, I thought it was March 1st, but that, that you need to post uh, previous years um, illness and, and injuries. Uh, employers uh, must, for, must provide and pay for uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, this, equip, this rule was effective uh, February 13, 2008 and implemented by May 15, 2018. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of uh, issues about that, right? Because some people feel that the employers have to, uh, somebody else has to pay for the safety. But it's a, it's a, it's a regulation. You need to are provide. Are they enforcing them? Mm -hmm. Sure they are. Yeah. I've never seen anybody give anybody. <laughs> when they show up on a job site and they interview one of your workers and they say, hey, how come you don't have a dust mask on? And he says, well, because they don't provide them, then you'll know. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm, not, right, I'm not a contractor. But, but this, I've seen that. I mean, everybody's wearing something different. This got a lot of kickback from contractors because they said, listen to me, the stuff I give my people, they don't take care of it. They throw it in the back of their truck. They can care less. So what contractors have had to do, they've had to say, hey, I have 15 carpenters so each carpenter when I hire him here's a harness here's this here's that here's that that has a life of two years three years safety glasses I'll give you a pair every three months and they have them sign off and say that they receive it. It. so yeah. when he gets caught when Jose gets caught while well, a safety glass and they say hey how come he doesn't have safety glass like I don't know you should ask him because I've given him three pairs in three months now you're somewhat off the hook no, no, no. I mean, so, I, I, so, I, when I was overseas as part of our contracts, and even in the, we had what they call health, uh, hygiene and health. Mm -hmm. And uh, the minute that anybody walked into the project, we had to give them, you know, a pair of safety boots, our hat, and of course they would have to sign in gloves and, you know, the whole work, the right. whole enchilada. But here I had never seen it. Seen, well, maybe I'm not a contractor. Yeah, they're, but they're, they were just being proactive there because maybe they had high insurance costs in there. No, 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 no. It's the law. Over there, it was the law. Okay, well, maybe it's no law there. But this, yeah, like you said, this got implemented in 2008, and they say it was, you know, effective and implemented. But a lot of contractors didn't even know about this well into 2009 mm -hmm. and into 2010, or they just. They just played dumb Ignored because it. they didn't want to have to supply well, this. Like uh, I said, I mean, I, I, I just get from a big project. Everybody had their hard hat and things like that. Mm -hmm. But you knew that they all got their own thing because they were all different. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Normally, a contractor buys one time. And that's, and that's, that's the problem with that, too, because then you get a contract that says, okay, now I'm going to get all these guys' gloves. I can't just buy a hundred pack of larges. Everybody's not a large. Yeah. Maybe you're small, you're a medium. Now, let's say I give you a large glove and you got a small hand, and now you get your hand caught in a piece of equipment and they say oh it's because his glove didn't fit him properly mm. now you got a whole nother issue on your hands yeah mm. and uh you know the, the other issue that uh, i've had in previous classes somebody told me that they you know they they have a zero tolerance for not wearing the hard hat but, but then employees will come without their hard hats and now you know you can't allow them on the job site but then you're losing manpower so the solution that they came with is uh, they bought uh, like 20 uh, pink hard hats. <laughs> so if you come without your hard hat, you are wearing a pink hard hat on the job site. <laughs> and that's enough to, to be really done once. Isn't that discrimination? <laughs> no, 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 you're it's color code. Pink. It's yeah, color code. It's color code. <laughs> You have a hard hat. <laughs> we we want to be able to tell who you let one to. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of clever. I like that idea. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be good. Look at that. On the bridges with the iron workers walking with a pink hat. <laughs> I really like that idea. If they're a union guy, they'll just go home. <laughs> and come back the next time. Right. won't work. Okay, so we, we, we have reviewed the, the standards. We looked at they fall into four categories. The general industry, construction, maritime, and agriculture. They have also their um, record keeping section. Uh, whenever there are no specific OSHA standards, employer must comply, comply with the general duty clause. Uh, 
you know. They also have on their website the most frequently cited uh, standards. So you can look into that and, and see, you know, what is the, the, the most frequently cited. General requirements, you need to have fall protection, ladders, training, hazard communications, and so on. So, you know, you, you, you can look and see what's uh, going on, what's the latest news. Um, okay. Here, uh, we, we, uh, the idea is that you, you, you know how to move within the regulations. So, what is the subpart for protection? Uh, as I said before, you, you can just go to the, uh, job, to the website and then uh, search for uh, falls in the OSHA, the job uh, under regulations. Oh, we did this already, right? But, uh, Construction, I can go um, search, find, fall. So we have fall protection. That is going to be subpart M of the 1926 Code of Federal Regulations. So we have all the uh, fall uh, protection over there. Then if the question is, you know, what is the fire protection? Again, the same thing or what uh, soft part K covers, then you can just go and look um, K here, it's uh, electrical. So, you know, that, that's your way to navigate over these uh, regulations and standards on the website. All right. Then uh, we go into uh, inspections. Um, OSHA authorized uh, the, the safety officers to conduct uh, workplace inspections at a reasonable time. OSHA conducts inspections without advance notice, except in very rare circumstances. Uh, and anyone who tells the employer about an OSHA inspection can receive fines and jail time. You want to make any comments? Well, there's been, there's been contractors who you got to be very careful when you have radios on your job site. Okay? Radios mm -hmm. where all the mm -hmm. subs have a radio, you have a radio, everybody communicates on that one channel. Because it happened to a contractor, and I'm sure it's happened to several, where they OSHA compliance officer shows up and they say, well, come into the trailer. When they come into the trailer, there's another radio there charging. And everybody out on the jobs, they say, hey, 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 clean up, clean up, OSHA's here, OSHA's here. And the guy's listening to everything, everything on the radio. Yeah. So if you're in the trailer, you look at him like, uh-oh. You know, so it's not it's not a good intro. Huh. So you have to be careful how you communicate and tell people because of that simple fact right there. I uh, also I posted a, a uh, <coughs> webinar that was going on for how to defend your rights in, a, in an OSHA inspection. Anyone of you, you, you told me you... you you, you, you listen to it. What, what, what did you learn from that? that it, it, it was interesting, uh, especially, uh, uh, it was done by, a, by an attorney who used to be the head of OSHA. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he just said the rights. I think, I think the, uh, the interesting thing is how many contractors get in trouble by the people that do not have nothing to do with it starts talking to the guy and starts spilling <laughs> the guts on something that they probably don't know anything about. Uh, he, he sampled one that this, this OSHA guy went in and had a complaint about a machine that was smoking, you know, and it was heating up. And the, sec <laughs> the receptionist, while waiting, he says, oh, that's nothing. You should see the other one. The other one is short-circuited. That, that's really nothing. <laughs> I went, whoa, oh, okay. <laughs> no, but he, he talked about, and probably you, you make sure that you take them to areas and do not, you take a picture and you take a reading right exactly at the same time that he takes whatever it. They, whatever they whatever want, he yeah. does, whatever you he, do it right there. And, mm -hmm. and even, even and let's say that they're going to take an air reading and it takes you 24 hours. You say, no, we need to take it with you. And uh, and th then they said, well, are you stopping me from doing it? I says, no, I'm just telling you that we need to take it with you. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, 
because they tried to say uh, you prohibit me, prohibiting me from doing it. So it was interesting. Yeah, it was an interesting, interesting webinar. I, yeah. I thought it was very. Yeah, I got it by luck. Yeah. yeah. In, in most instances, don't they tell you they're coming to the job site though? No. Uh, no. No. Oh, no. They come by surprise. Yeah. And uh, when I was getting my, my OSHA 500, the, the guy was saying that the inspectors, most of the time, they do their work, uh, their homework pretty good. I mean, when they target you for a visit, they will go around your site for a week or so. They will take pictures. They will, you know, make videos. And then they go and, and ask you, hey, do you guys uh, sometimes don't wear floor protection? Mm -hmm. No, no, no. They always wear for protection. Is this your job site? Mm -hmm. Is that the guy that works for you? Is he wearing for protection? No? Okay. They they have all that information already and they, you know, they come to get you. <laughs> they they will certainly will do that. So, what triggers an, an inspection? Uh, the first priority they have is imminent danger when uh, there's a reasonable certainty that an immediate danger exists they will they will come you know obviously somebody has to alert them or they have to be passing by and see the situation and, and, and then uh, they will come in. fatality and catastrophe you know you, you need you, you have eight hours to report to OSHA the death of an employee or the hospitalization of three or more employees so as you report to them, they will come in. Complaints and referrals, uh, a worker or a worker representative can file a complaint about safety or health hazard. They will go over there. And then they have uh, their own program uh, inspections. They, they look at industries with the high incident rates. They look at companies that are well known for being in, uh, in an accident prone, and then they will go over there and visit. So that, that's the, the four uh, priorities of the inspections. And then they, they have uh, citations and penalties. You know, they, they have uh, different types. Willful, a violation that the employee intentionally and knowingly commits, or a, a violation that the employer commits with plain indifference to the law. And this can come pretty expensive. You know, it's up to $70,000 for each willful violation. Which, uh, with a minimum penalty of 5,000 for each uh, willful violation. And uh, this lady was explaining that that's each violation. So if you have five employees doing the same thing, five you have five times 70,000. So it gets pretty expensive very fast. Serious. Uh, a violation where there is substantial probability that the death of serious. Uh, physical harm could result and that uh, the employer knew or should have known of the hazards. Penalty uh, for serious violation may be up to 7,000. Other than serious, a violation that direct relationship to safety and health but probably would not cause death or serious physical harm, 7,000. And then repeated. Violation that is the same or similar to a previous violation. That can go up to seventy thousand uh, dollars for each repeated violation. And what I didn't know that I learned uh, this week is that it doesn't have to be at the same job site. If the company was having a issue, a violation in another state, up to five years ago, they can cite you for a repeated violation. So that that uh, that can come, uh, you know, pretty expensive. One of the, the things on a slide, you almost always win yourself a serious violation, right there, where it says physical harm could result, and that the employer knew. Obviously. What happens when you have a foreman out on the site and he sees OSHA shows up? He's nervous at this point, so they say, "Hey, is that one of your guys? Why isn't he tied off?" Oh man, I told that guy thousands of times. You just told OSHA that you've known. For a long time so uh -huh. now you already got yourself a serious if not a willful because you're allowing it to keep happening mm -hmm. so that's why they say you shut up yes no i don't know i'm not the manager go to that trailer right over there okay? it's interesting in that webinar what what they they were saying is mm -hmm. oh you want to talk to our employees you bring them to the trailer to the trailer you don't take the guy walking around you know 
up to the, the, the personnel. Right. You bring the people to the train. Right. You just take them in out only to see to what see they're very specific. Exactly. Well, that's that they're, they're, they're obligated by law to stay within that. There's a complaint that says, hey, in the southwest corner of your job site, there's an excavation. They keep putting me to work there. You have to walk him, and his inspection is limited to yeah. that excavation where the complaint came from. Now, what happens? In walking to that excavation, there's an idiot thing. A, idiot B, and idiot C in route. Okay? So, idiot A, B, and C just opened up the whole job site to an OSHA inspection. And then they're like, okay, now I'm going to be here the whole day, go get lunch, call in reinforcements, and then your whole job site is literally stopped at being inspected. So that's that's usually what happens. So, if, you know, if you have a big injury or somewhere where you have to report to OSHA and you can expect them coming, you obviously <coughs> want to know a path of where you're going to take them, how you're going to take them. And you change the you people know. working. <laughs> no, you know, no, no, listen, that, they're real. They're real keen on that. You're not going to walk in and be like, okay, it's a eighty million dollar project, and all of a sudden you got seventeen people doing work here. Oh, come on, you should have at least over a hundred people here working. They're not stupid. And so if they see that happening, they'll just drag their feet some more, and then they'll start knickknacking you. Oh, that fire extinguisher is not the right height. Oh, this is over here. You got a nail hanging out, and then you don't want to get into that. Mm -hmm. So you you, you got to be very careful about how you go protecting yourself without making them think that you're hiding shit. Hmm. Your interesting thing that they said in the, uh, in the the webinar is that you don't have to give them all your records no. and paperwork. You ask the the, the person, okay, what documents do you want? And I'll give them to you. Yeah. Submit, do you tell OSHA to submit a written request for them and you have seven days in which to produce that. But in those seven days, you can review it, you can make sure they're filled out correctly, you can have your legal counsel review it, make sure that it's kosher, and then you send it over. Because yeah. what happens, they send, you send, you give them something, it's it's law, and it's, you're gonna see it in court. You, yeah. you, you're no, gonna once, get slapped in the face. Once you have it in. Once you have it in, but that's oh, almost sure. on any they will use and I'm going to say, hey, we had an inspection. Hey, can you sign here? Don't sign nothing. You're not a principal of the company. And even if you are, hey, I need to speak with other principals of the company. You're not obligated to sign anything. Right. Yeah, that's it. it they, that's you may piss them idea. off, but you're not obligated yeah. to sign. And they know. They know that. Yeah, also the thing was that uh, he said, well, I'm here and i got to go. And you have to tell them. You can say, no, 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 no. You have to wait for this person. And I think they got what, an hour, one hour or a day? One hour or, to, no, one hour it has to, to wait. Be, it has to be reasonable. Usually the best thing you can do is put them on the phone with the person that they're going to yeah. be expecting so they don't think that you're just telling them yeah. some story, you know, um, and put them on the phone with you, let them know, hey, I'm in, I'm in, I'm uh, over there, I'll be there in 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Um, some of them say, hey, you know what, I'm done waiting, I'm walking. In that case, your project manager and your superintendent got to take them out and walk with them. But, you know, usually what, what I would suggest is that if you do that, then you have your safety representative or your consultant on the phone, on speaker, so he can be present, yeah, if you will, good. somewhat present, if you will, during the walk. All right. Uh, where can you go for help? Uh, you can look at the uh, OSHA website. You can look at uh, outside uh, OSHA, also NIOSH, you know, those... Uh, um, institutes that have to do with uh, with health, and then how to uh, cite a complaint. We looked at that. We looked at the uh, OSHA training institute centers, doctor, nurses. Those are all sources of information that you can uh, go. Um, let me see. Yeah, this is uh, we're more almost almost done. I was yeah, going to bring some handouts, but I, I honestly forgot. So we'll do. We'll have a session where we will fill in some forms and, and do do that exercise uh, later on. So that's a, we will download the OSHA seven form, write a complaint, and so on. We'll, we'll do that at another time. So I apologize I didn't bring that in today. Plus, you know, we're pretty close to lunch time already, so. I figure you guys want to go home, right? Well, you want to no. have lunch and then no, no. keep on with your next class. No, no, <laughs> any questions, any comments about what we have uh, covered today? No? Please remember to sign the uh, sign sheet and you're free to go. See you guys next Saturday. Yes.